Good evening. <laughs> um, my name is Sarah Jorgensen, and I'm the committee chair of Mortarboard's last lecture series. Thank you so much all for coming tonight. We're so excited to have you. I know many of you are eager to hear Dr. Ferber speak, but first, I would just like to let you know a little bit about Mortarboard, as well as the origin of the last lecture series. Mortarboard is a National Collegiate Honor Society, which is founded in 1918. It was an all-women's society until 1975, when men were finally allowed to join. U <laughs> USD opened its doors to, more in the to the first Mortarboard chapter here uh, about 10 years ago, and since then, it's been recognized nationally, receiving awards such as the Golden Torch Award, the Project for Excellence Award, and the Excellence in Advising Award. As part of our commitment to leadership, scholarship, and service, Mortarboard began hosting the last lecture series within a few years ago. It was inspired by its originator, Randy Posh, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon. He had the idea to give a speech as if it were his last lecture ever, imparting wisdom and life advice he had picked up along the way. To the dismay of his students and colleagues, Posh was actually di diagnosed with cancer shortly thereafter. Learning this news, he continued to give his last lecture, and the speech was encapsulated in a book entitled The Last Lecture. USD Mortarboard has adapted this concept to honor and acknowledge two faculty members a year. In the past, the series included a talk from Professor Romney, who was leaving USD that academic year, and last semester, Dr. Somo gave her last lecture prior to the Dalai Lama's visit, imparting her wisdom in connection to Buddhism. Tonight, we continue this tradition by honoring Dr. Barton Thurber. Dr. Thurber received his BA degree from Stanford and his MA and PhD degrees from Harvard. He teaches classes in poetry, romanticism, and 19th century British literature. His research, in, his research interests include those areas as well as the impacts of digital technologies on narrative and on the humanities in general. He was also recently acknowledged as one of the top professors in the country by the Princeton Review. It's impossible to measure the magnitude of his contributions and passion for USD and his students over the course of his 34 year career here. Doc having Dr. Thurber speak tonight is bittersweet as he's beginning the, his process of retirement. In a sense, this is his last lecture, and I believe it goes without saying that he'll be deeply missed by his students and colleagues. So without further ado, I ask that you join me in welcoming Dr. Barton Thurber. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, well, I hope this is not literally my last lecture in the sense that it was for the person who started this. It's actually what I'd rather say is this is my first lecture as well as my last lecture because I've never understood what I do in the classroom as lecturing. And for those of you who have been in class with me will understand if I say that whatever goes on in that classroom is stranger than any regular lecture ought to be. <laughs> but this is a regular lecture and I'm honored to be here, uh, especially at the invitation of the Mortarboard Society. Um, of which I'm an admirer, I was once a mortarboard advisor. Uh, even in a completely admirable student body like our own, you guys stand out uh, in leadership, scholarship, and service. You're an inspiration to all of us, and I will do everything I can to be worthy of you and all of you this evening. My topic tonight is the current crisis in academic freedom at the university. And to address that, I'll be drawing from summarizing or paraphrasing certain documents, emails, and messages that have emerged in the course of this crisis. You do not, at this moment, have access to those documents, which I regret. I hope that you'll take the time at some point to check the accuracy of what I have to say. One very preliminary way to do that is to look at a website some of the faculty had set up, have set up as an archive of documents relating to the current controversy. At the moment, that website is unbelievably simple. No graphics, all it says is documents, and it's incomplete in that some of the documents I'll read from tonight, it has some of the documents I'll read from tonight, but not all of them. In the coming days and weeks, we will try to make that archive as complete a record of this extraordinary moment in the history of the university as we can. I don't know if you have a way to write this down. I don't have a way to write it down for you. I can repeat it later. The website is http colon double slash home dot san diego dot edu backslash tilde, that curvy line, Baber, B-A-B-E-R, 
backslash trouble, backslash die. <laughs> backslash, it was Harriet Baber's naming of it, not me. Uh, trouble backslash documents.html. Let me begin by quoting part of President's, uh, President Lyon's initial email to Tina Beattie, the theologian at Digby Stewart College, Roehampton University in the UK. To Tina Beattie, October 27, 2012, and I quote, it has come to my attention that an invitation was extended to you to be a Francis G. Harp's Center of Catholic Thought and Culture visiting fellow at the University of San Diego, and in that capacity and as a Catholic theologian to deliver public lectures. The center's primary mission, consistent with the intentions of those who have financially supported the center, is to provide opportunities to engage the Catholic intellectual tradition in its diverse embodiments, doctrinal, spiritual, moral, literary, artistic, and social. This would include clear and consistent presentations concerning the church's moral teachings, teachings with which you as a Catholic theologian dissent publicly. In light of the contradiction between the mission of the center and your own public stances as a Catholic theologian, I regretfully rescind the invitation that has been extended to you. I hope that you understand the difficulties associated with this decision, one to which I arrived with great and thoughtful consideration. Tina Beatty subsequently described her response to the president's email as follows, again in part. On Sunday morning, 28th October, I received a letter by email from Dr. Mary Lyons saying that she was rescinding the invitation because I, quote, dissent publicly from the church's moral teaching. I appealed to her to reconsider and offered to work with her to find a positive outcome. However, on 30th October, I received a response saying that her decision was final. This controversy came about because I'd signed a letter to the Times of London, along with 26 others, saying that Catholics should, could, quote, using fully informed consciences, support the legal extension of civil marriage to same-sex couples. Signatories included six priests and several other theologians. And she further states that the real issues are academic freedom and the vocation of lay theologians in relation, in relation to the official magisterium, However, this controversy also shows how deep the crisis has become. To which Gerald Mannion, who is the head of the Francis G. Harp Center for Catholic Thought and Culture, or CCTC, and the one who had invited Tina Patey on behalf of the CCTC, reacted as follows, again in part, we don't have time tonight to look at all these documents completely, but I hope that you will check the website and satisfy yourself about the content of the, these documents. Gerald Mannion, quote, I was surprised, shocked, and deeply disappointed by this decision. Not only was I not consulted about it, or, nor forewarned, I had received assurances from senior administrators earlier that week that Professor Beatty's visit would go ahead because this was clearly a question of academic freedom. I find the public rationale offered for this decision deeply disturbing on several fronts. First, the statements about the mission of the center, its donors and positions one might assume that guests invited by the center would take to be utterly novel to the person who is now in his third year as center director. Second, they run directly counter to assurances about academic freedom that I received before and since taking up the position. Third, Professor Beatty is in no way guilty of what that rationale purports her to be guilty of. Even if she were, the university's policy on academic freedom would surely safeguard her against sanction. USD and the CCTC itself have previously had speakers who would fall foul of this new injunction. And yet, to date, the present director has not been spoken to about this matter at all by President Lyons. A letter to her from myself, October 29th, outlining the errors and implications of this decision has received no reply. On October 31st, the Center's Advisory Council requested a meeting with President Lyons as a matter of urgency. That request also remains without acknowledgement or response. On Tuesday, November 6th, the Academic Assembly, which is all the professors in the College of Arts and Sciences, voted overwhelmingly to ask President Lyons to reconsider. On November 8th, the president replied as follows, in part, one academic theologian put the matter succinctly. Theologians can and indeed must probe the tradition and raise critical questions. This is how a tradition develops and continues to speak with credibility and relevancy to succeeding generations. However, engaging in open defiance of the church pastors by signing public letters designed to undermine the confidence of the laity in the leadership of their bishops is not an appropriate or responsible way of seeking to advance the development of the tradition. So what does this have to do with my decision to rescind the invitation to Dr. Beatty? Her public position in opposition to church teaching as a Catholic theologian is incompatible with the CCTC's purpose. In addition, offering an honorary fellowship would be a betrayal of those benefactors who supported the center with that purpose in mind. The CCTC director provided no notification of Dr. Beatty's public action in August. 
On November 9th, the members of the advisory board of the CCTC wrote to the president saying in part, we wholeheartedly support the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences in urging you to reinstate the invitation of Pref Professor Beatty to come to USD as a visiting scholar of the CCTC without delay. Your current position that Professor Beatty is not an appropriate speaker or visiting fellow for USD's Center for Catholic Thought and Culture, along with the non-consultative manner in which you made the decision, <clears throat> raises serious con concerns for us about the future of CCTC as well as our role as its advisors. We find the rationale for your decision to be inconsistent with our understanding of the nature, role, and mission of the CCTC as historically understood and lived out. We regret that your most recent statement does not modify your decision, but rather appears to modify only the reasons for it, which in our opinion remain invalid. On November 13th, the President again responded to the Assembly's request that she reconsider, quote, in response to the Assembly's request that she reconsider, I'm endorsing that Dr. Beatty be invited by the CCTC to speak at USD as early as the spring semester without conferring upon her an honorary affiliation with the university. I also recognize that regardless of whether the director of the CCTC chooses to extend such an invitation, our university con uh, community must continue to work <coughs> to seek ways to reckon with the very challenging issue issues associated with our identity as a Catholic university. However, on that same date, the Academic Assembly reconfirmed and addressed the following motion, which reads in part one. Your responses ignore the way you've treated Gerald, Ger Gerard Mannion, no prior consultation, no notice that your actions would be forthcoming, no notice that you were concerned or even involved in the issue of Tina Be Beatty. You assume you have the sole right to veto or approve visiting scholar appointments, which is in itself a violation of academic freedom. Two. You ignore the pattern of abuse in recent years, including most especially the Ruther affair. I'll have more to say about that later. <clears throat> Three, and there are other, uh, uh, well, there's more to this pattern as well, but for now, let's just mention the Ruther affair. Three, you've done nothing to ensure that this pattern of ethical failures will stop or even moderate in the future, nor do you acknowledge that there have been issues, much less failures within your ethical leadership of the university. Four, and above all, your letter does not resolve issues of academic freedom at the University of San Diego. In your eyes, there are evidently those we invite and honor, and those we invite and do not honor, which puts the university in an ethically impossible situation. Which is which? How would we know? And how come you get to decide? If some are honorable and some are not, can academic freedom be said to exist at USD? And why would someone not so honored want to come to USD? Given these considerations, the Academic Assembly believes you have shown yourself to be ethically bankrupt, and by a vote of 99, 4, 16 against, and 19 abstentions, declares a loss of confidence in your leadership. On November 15th, the USD Associated Students requested via a number of resolutions that the President, A, well, formally reconcile with Dr. Tina Beatty and the Center for Catholic Thought and Culture, as well as the faculty, staff, and students of the University of San Diego, and that President Mary Lyons present a formal statement either written or verbal, to the undergraduate student population outlining the considerations that inform the President's decision on this matter. On that same date, a group of faculty dissenting in part from the assembly motion wrote that whereas many of us do not agree with the decision President Lyons made to rescind the invitation to Dr. Tina Beatty, and irrespective of how we voted on the matter of no confidence, we reject the characterization of President Lyons as being ethically bankrupt. We reject the attempt to turn this unfortunate episode into a character assassination and urge our colleagues to raise the level of civility and discourse so that respectful disagreement and dialogue can occur. I was the author of that motion. Since you have just heard the motion, I'm content to leave it to you to decide whether that was character assassination or a fair summation of what her actions add up to and that rather than assassinate her character, I was, along with most of the academic assembly then present, trying above all to speak truth to power. On Thursday, November 15th, President Lyons addressed USD's University Senate. On November 24th, Mary Doak, a faculty member in uh, Theology and Religious Studies and a member of the CTCC Advisory Board, together with Daniel Sheehan, Professor of Physics, responded in an email to the President's Senate appearance as follows. President Lyons has recently and repeatedly claimed that her objection to, to Professor Beatty's visit was her receiving an honorary fellowship from the Harp Center of Catholic Thought and Culture. But Professor Beatty was not offered an honorary fellowship. 
She was invited to give the second annual Amelia Switgall Lecture and to be a visiting fellow of the CCTC. Her responsibilities as a visiting fellow of the CCTC were to give a few campus talks in addition to the Switgall Lecture and to engage faculty and students in discussion during her visit. There was no question of a fellowship, whether in any sense, whether in the usual sense of a large monetary award to, find a period, to fund a period of research or in any other sense. No was this an honorary position in any name, in any sense. Pres President Lyons also asserted that Professor Beattie discussed, descended publicly from the teachers of, teachings of the Catholic Church by sign, signing the August 13th letter published in the Times of London. But Professor Beattie did not descend from the teachings of the Catholic Church by signing that letter. The position taken by the signata signatories of the letter simply affirms the reality that there is no binding Catholic teaching on civil legislation regarding same-sex marriage. On this, as in other matters, Catholics must inform and follow their consciences. President Lyons has claimed repeatedly that Professor Beattie urged Catholics to dissent from, Catholic, from church teachings, but Professor Beattie did not urge others to dissent from church teaching or, or to disregard the guidance of their appropriate pastors. The August 13th letter affirmed that Catholics could, in good and properly formed conscience, support legislating, legislation allowing same-sex civil marriage. The letter does not say that they should do that. And finally, President Lyons has maintained that she did not have time to find an alternative to canceling Professor Beattie's visit. That was in her sentence presentation. But she did have time and was asked to find an alternative to canceling Professor's visit. There were nine days between October 18th when Pre President Lyons acknowledges receipt of a complaint about Professor uh, Beattie's upcoming talks and the evening of October 27th when Pre President Lyons' rescission of invitation was emailed to Professor Beattie. Further, between October 28th and October 30th, Professors Gerard Mannion, Mary Doak, and Tina Beattie all mailed President Lyons to ask her to work to resolve this conflict before the rescission became public and to allow Professor Beattie to come to campus in some manner, even if necessary, under some other sponsorship than that of the CCTC. In response to these requests, Professor Beattie's invitation to work together to find a creative solution to this crisis, President Lyons responded to Professor Beattie via an email on October 30th, reaffirming that President Lyons' original decision to rescind the invitation stands. <clears throat> President Lyons has suggested, finally, that canceling academic lectures and visits by theologians or other scholars who dissent from Catholic teaching is within the, within the obligations and normal expectations of a Catholic university. But canceling academic lectures of scholars who dissent from Catholic teachers is not a part of the obligations or normal expectations of a Catholic university. A recently published book called Silence Speaks, 2011, cites exactly one example of a Catholic university receiving an invitation to a lay theologian, the University of San Diego's rescission of Professor R Rosemary Radford Ruther's invitation to hold the Portland chair in 2008. Thus far, a request to 